Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Northwest Liberty News. Picking the lock on the shackles of tyranny. Machines are going to fail. And the system's going to fail. The past is past. The future is now. Don't look at me. I think these people are completely nuts. Sometimes trouble just follows a man. There is another organism on this planet that follows the same pattern. Do you know what it is? A virus. Can't you stop your lips from flapping for two little minutes? It's because I'm white. I'm a man. I'm sensitive. I need to feel loved. I need to be desired. Eh, I'm rapidly becoming a big underground success in this. Eh. Uh, that's a question of methods. Everybody wants results, but nobody wants to do what they have to do to get them done. And now, coming to you live from Kalispell, Montana, brought to you by Northwest Liberty News, it's Montana Gazette Radio with your host, James White. Okay, I'm your host, James White. This is Montana Gazette Radio. Thanks so much for joining me here today, here today on this 20th day of November. Can't believe it's already 20th day of November, but it is indeed. So much for, uh, again, thanks so much for joining us. We should be simulcasting on numerous networks here, like seven or eight different networks, a couple of Facebook pages, a couple of uh, YouTube pages, D Live, Twitch, and the, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, the Blog Talk Radio. Uh, those links should all be in the Facebook pages if you want to listen that way. Again, we appreciate you joining us. We've got a, a big show today, Freedom Friday. If you're not familiar with Freedom Friday, uh, on Fridays we usually have Ron Gibson on, on one Friday, who's here today. He talks about court, uh, court stuff, legal stuff, uh, land patents, that type of thing. And then uh, the alternate Friday, we have Gene Pringle, who's our tax expert. And he was here last Friday, and he will be here next Friday. But uh, we are delighted to have uh, Ron Gibson join us today to talk about the 12 presumptions of the court. And if you're not familiar with uh, the 12 presumptions of the court, um, you're, I, I was shocked when I first heard Ron lay it all out. Uh, and uh, I, I couldn't believe it, but it's it's true. I mean, I try to say couldn't believe it. These days, it's probably... Really just about anything these days um, but we're uh, we're gonna have Ron join us here he should be calling in, in just a minute in the meantime I'm gonna give him a, a proper introduction here and read his bio joining us here as I said in a moment as soon as he calls in uh, is Ron Gibson Ron Gibson is a former US Marine and Vietnam veteran who currently works as a professional consultant counselor counselor at law with over 48 years of experience on the subject of land patents mining law, right of way, contracts, water rights, and constitutional law. He was raised on a ranch in Southern Oregon, and he got his education in engineering and constitutional law. Having a cattle ranch and mineral background has helped him tackle many of the issues facing rural America today. Ron has several gold and industrial mineral projects in the Western U.S. He currently serves as vice president of the Southwest Oregon Mining Association, and is the chairman of the Jefferson Mining District located in Southern Oregon. As a licensed pilot, Ron has designed a helicopter and is the inventor of two environmental cleanup products. Additionally, he is also involved in turbine engines, marine power boat plants, and turbine propulsion projects for helicopters and airplanes. His love of history and lifelong experience in cattle and horses has also served him well in his land, hay, alfalfa, and high-quality beef operations. In his spare time, Ron enjoys collectible auto restoration, raising quarter horses and paint horses, flying and teaching classes on constitutional law, mining law, and land patents. And if you haven't heard Ron Gibson on the show before, folks, you're in for a treat. Looks like he's here now. Let's bring him on the show. Ron Gibson, thanks so much for joining us here on Montana Gazette Radio. Well, good morning, James. How you doing? Doing great, Ron. Doing great, Ron. Always great to have you here on the show. Uh, of course, uh, you've been here, uh, wow, numerous times uh, on the, vari the various shows that I've broadcast on, the various names, I've, the banners I've broadcast under. And uh, you probably have the most viewed video, one of my most viewed videos on my YouTube channel, uh, The Truth Will Set You Free, I believe is the name of it. And uh, it's a five-part series. You came here in Kalispell here at the college and did a, a full day seminar. I recorded the whole thing and of course with your permission, put it up on the YouTube channel and uh, 
I'll tell you one thing, Ron. You've given people, you've given a lot of people basically a college education about who they really are with your videos and your uh, your appearances on the show. And again, my friend, I know it's <clears throat> early there where you're at, but thanks so much for joining us here today. And we're going to be talking about the 12 presumptions of the court. And uh, let us let us um, let's lay that let's lay that foundation down first, Ron. Um, when we say the court, of course, we're, we're talking about uh, all courts. We're talking about local courts. We're talking about district courts, family courts. Um, it basically could, the court system, the judicial system. Uh, it's it's really it's really designed to work against you. And I know people probably don't understand that, but it's it's true. So we're going to lay these twelve presumptions out, Ron, one by one. And uh, we have the ability to take phone calls later if we want to for people to call in and uh, and uh, comment on them. But, Ron, as usual, I'm just going to turn it over to you, brother, and I'm only going to briefly interrupt when I if I think something's unclear or I think something needs to be fleshed out a little bit. Uh, other than that, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, go ahead and kick it off with the 12 presumptions of the court. Ron Gibson. Well, again, <clears throat> thank you, James, and want to welcome all of your listeners Excuse me. <laughs> this morning, uh, I hope that what I share here this morning will be, first of all, of interest to you and also a benefit. Uh, this subject matter that we're going to be discussing, called the 12 presumptions of the court, uh, applies in every court in our nation, unfortunately. And before I get started, I think it's very important that you folks understand the foundation of what I'm going to present here this morning on the basis that what you perceive a court to be and to do for your benefit when you're in a court setting is 99 and 44 percent. Uh, in error, if I can put it in that context. The courts do not work on facts and figures and, and law and right and wrong. Courts function on what's called a presumption. And a presumption is an element that can be manipulated terribly and is manipulated terribly when it comes to you standing in a courtroom. And so we're going to go through these, uh, and, and uh, I would ask that you pay close attention to what these presumptions are, and secondly, of what they do to your detriment. And that's why you need to pay attention, both what I'm sharing with you this morning and also if you're ever in a court setting. Presumption number one is the presumption of a public record. Now, we've all watched Perry Mason program and others, and they talk about, boy, this is a court of record, da 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 Well, let me share with you what the 12 presumptions of the public record are, or maybe better termed, or not. It is a matter brought before a lower Roman court. That's the court system that we have in our country. We don't have justice courts in this country anymore. Uh, it is a matter for the public record. Now, the public record, so that you understand what that is, is that it is being recorded. You're, being, you're receiving a fair hearing relative to your opportunity to come and present your side of a case before a court that should be by virtue of, of an overseer of an unbiased judge. Well, because the judge is a bar member, the prosecutor is a bar member, your defense attorney is a bar member, you know, a public defender is a bar member, you got everything stacked against you when you go into these Roman courts because that's what we're dealing with. And it says a court of re public record when, in fact, it is presumed, listen to the language here, <clears throat> by the members of the private bar guild, that means the bar association, that the matter is a private bar guild business matter. 
I can tell you it is not unless openly rebuked and rejected by stating clearly that the matter is to be on the public record. The matter remains a private bar guild matter completely under private bar guild rules and other items that that pertain to that. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what happens here. The presumption is and is presented to you that this, in most cases, is a a, a public uh, uh, hearing uh, of a court of record when, in fact, they don't want you to have a court of public record simply because it makes it very, very difficult for you then to appeal that decision because there is no court record of it. What are you going to appeal? An appeal is what the court has done wrong. That's the basis uh, in most instances of an appeal. Well, they hide that from you. They present to you that it is a court of record when in fact it is not. And so I bring these to you here this morning for the fact that you have to object. If you go in there and they claim that this is a public court of record, then you want the court to validate that public record standing, okay? And then you need to openly rebuke and uh, uh, reject by standing clearly on the matter of the public record. The matter remains a private bar guild matter completely under the private control of the bar association. In other words, they're controlling, they're keeping it hid, and you don't get your true day in court. You have no means of appeal. Number two, the presumption of the public service. We all think the judges and all of these people are public servants. What a joke. The presumption of public service is that all members of the private bar guild who have all sworn a solemn, secret, absolute oath to their guild, then act as a public agent of the government or a public officer by making additional oaths to the public officer and openly and deliberately contradict their private superior oaths by their own guild. Unless openly rebuked and rejected, the claim stands that these present bar guild members that they are legitimate public servants and trustees, uh, or therefore trustees, under the public oath doctrine. Now, let me explain that a little bit. What I just read to you is that the bar members take two oaths. They take one to the bar association, of which is their first and foremost allegiance, And then they take a public oath declaring that they're going to uphold the Constitution of the United States and and da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. When push comes to shove, they always fall back on their private bar guild, which means, folks, they are not public servants. No. They're a private corporation for profit at your expense. Yeah, Jim, did you? Have a yeah, comment? I just want the folks to know that I've got a document I pulled up here. It's not exactly the same one you're reading from. I found one on the web. I know we talked about it earlier, but it's almost word for word what you're stating. I think we've got two similar documents. I just wanted the viewers to know that I've got the document as you're reading it. It's not exactly what you're saying, but very, very close. So I just wanted you to uh, just, just let the, the listeners know that. Go, go ahead, Ron. Continue. Please continue. So now we we are are informed by this very uh, document here that the Bar Association is neither truthful nor are they dedicated to a public servant's position. And I don't know about you folks, but that is terribly alarming. And we have a great deal of damage in our country today because of this very issue that we're discussing here this morning. Number three, the presumption 
of a public oath. Remember I mentioned to you a moment ago that they pretend, uh, and that's what they are, are pretenders, uh, that, uh, hang on just a second here, that they are giving, their, it, I guess the best way I know how to put it, it's showtime. They come on and they put this big display on, we take this public oath, da-da, da-da, da-da. The presumption of the public oath is that all members of the private bar guild acting in the capacity. Now look at the word acting. Boy, that's a true statement. In the capacity of a public official who has sworn a solemn public oath remains bound by their oath and therefore bound to serve honestly, impartially, and fairly, and dedicated as dictated, excuse me, by their oath, unless openly challenged and demanded that the presumption will be stand and that the private bar guild members have functioned under their public oath is a contradiction to their guild oath. If challenged, such individual must recruit themselves as having a conflict of interest and cannot possibly stand under a public oath. Hey, no, that's Ron, very interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. Man. I was going to stop right there. Can't you challenge? I mean, if you, it sounds to me, if you challenge uh, them right there and say you need to make, you need to choose. What are you gonna? Are you gonna take your oath f- to the bar? Or are you gonna take your oath, uh, you know, to the Constitution or to to the public? And you tell them. I'm, what I'm reading here is they have to fail back to their bar guild. They 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 can't. That's a conflict of interest for them. That's interesting. I didn't catch that last time we talked well, about it. And, and and that's absolutely correct. But, boy, you talk about putting an, an attorney in a bind is when you challenge that because they're depending upon the public not knowing anything about this. And it is a conflict of interest. And you can make an oral motion at that very point to have your case dismissed because of this conflict of interest. That applies to the judge. It applies to the prosecutor. It's it is such a sham. Uh, it, it's really shameful. I, I don't know how else uh, to describe it, because it is such a facade that has been perpetrated on the American people that depend upon, and most Americans don't know what their rights are, and which is a tragedy in its own right. The federal courts have stated over and over and over in cases, I do a tremendous amount of law research, and the courts have said, if you don't know your rights, then you don't have any rights. Not that they're not there for you, but let me give you an example. You take a copy of the Constitution, and I pray all of you have a copy, and I pray, further pray, that you read it. But you can take that Constitution and lay it on the table or the counter or wherever. And if you don't pick that up and you don't read it and you don't do something relative to what that Constitution protects your God-given rights, then in essence you kind of deserve what you get. And I hope you understand the point I'm making. That Constitution is not what it is not is a self-executing document. You and I have to do something with that document. And it spells out the limitations of government, and we're not taking advantage of that. That's why this subject matter we're talking about today is so very critical, because you're being treated and viewed upon as a on the basis of presumption, not of the facts in a case. And, boy, that, I'm telling you, it just spins this thing 180 degrees. You know what this, hey. you know, you know what this brings up in my okay. mind, Ron? You know what, my, Ron, this brings up in my mind? Is there any wonder that so many of these legislators are, ter- are bar attorneys? That's why nothing ever gets, that's why no one ever goes after these presumptions and stands up for the folks, because most of the people that are lawmakers are part of the bar. They're part of the club. They, they're, you, they, they're not going to, they're not going to go. break up their own club. I mean, how many people that serve in the legislature and all across the country, especially uh, in, in D.C., are bar, are bar lawyers? What, 60, 70% of them? 
This is all a giant club, folks, and we're not in it. I would say that the percentage is much higher than that. What the Bar Association has done and is doing, they've infiltrated every entity that they possibly can. They're now on local school boards. They're on on, on major businesses. They're a, a part of that to manipulate this. Uh, I did a law class about a year and a half ago, and I've been asked to do it again and maybe <laughs> – <laughs> Jim, I can do this on on your program sometime, but uh, the title of the class <clears throat> that I <laughs> excuse me that I did was why attorneys are not lawyers, and everybody has the presumption, which is wrong, that an attorney is a lawyer and a lawyer is an attorney. And I can tell you that is absolutely false. The, the the motivation and the intent of a lawyer and a an attorney are totally different. And and I'm going to save the rest of that till we do a class because you're going to be shocked what I share with you on that subject in itself. But our schools are infiltrated with it. Every segment of government is infiltrated simply because. They're, they're dictating and manipulating legislation. Now, I'm going to say a subject here that most people do not know. In most states, if not all of them, I haven't checked them all out, but a lot of them, and they have a letter before any type of statutes or codes, okay? And here where I live in Oregon, it's ORS, Oregon Revised Statute. Let me tell you the problem with that is that people think, oh, well, this is what the legislator, uh, legislation passed and the governor signs and all of that garbage, is the very fact that once the state legislature uh, has enacted an act and signed by the governor, it, here in Oregon, it goes to a three-attorney group that changed that law that was passed that's why it's called revised, Oregon revised statute. That's true in all of the rest of the states. They manipulate that by changing a comma or a period or rearranging words in that. And because you and I are not part of the legislative hearings on the thing, we don't really know what it is. All we get is the end result when, in fact, we have been lied to, and that's changed for the benefit of the state not for your and I's benefit. And boy, I mean to tell you, when I bring this subject up, they squeal like a pig under a gate. But that's exactly what happens here, folks. You're being manipulated by your own elected officials by virtue. It goes to a special group in the back room of the, of the Capitol here in, in, in Salem, in, in the state where I live. And, and it's tragic. And I have researched on numerous occasions what the legislation actually passed versus what came out and published under the Oregon revised statute. And in many instances, and if not most instances, it's changed. And the, and the, and the, and the public, <clears throat> we, we have no idea that that's going on. So really an element of concern, I guess, is the point that I'm trying to make here. And it's all because of this bar guild. All right, Ron. Ron, Ron let me pa Ron, let me pause you for a second, and then we'll go on to number four here. This has been this is very timely right now. It's it's the, starting today. The governor governor of uh, Montana has uh, impo imposed another lockdown across the country. They're imposing more lockdowns. They're trying to force people to wear a mask, telling you can't leave your house if you wear a mask. You get a fine. This is all not within any of their constitutional authority to do any of this stuff, is it, Ron? I mean, they, they, they have no – the governor can't just make a sweeping a proclamation across the whole state that everybody's got to stay inside or got to close their business down or wear a mask. This, is, this goes way beyond their, their authority, does it not? I don't care what state you're in or what constitution you're looking at. They don't have the right to do that, do they, Ron? Boy, you, you've, you've hit a subject and right on the head of the nail. Let me share something with you folks of your listening audience here, Jim. And that is it is grossly misunderstood 
I've been in law for 48 years. Uh, my background is constitutional law. Uh, I'm not an attorney. I'm a lawyer. Okay. So let, let's let's take a look at that very subject. All of you, I'm sure, have heard, well, the governor issued an executive order. Let me explain to you what the real intent of an executive order is and how it's to be applied, okay? We'll just take a little short detour here because it's important. And that is the issue, the purpose for, for creating in our governing body an executive order was so that the governor or the president of the United States in that particular case gives a directive. That's what an executive order is for the defense department here, for the transportation department or the health department or whatever that immediate cabinet is. It's that the governor gives a directive on a daily basis and most generally about what it is or business that they are to undertake. It has nothing to do with we the public and what people do not understand we're sovereigns we're sovereigns by creation of almighty God and sovereigns make and create government and sovereigns are the creators of law not the victims of law and very few people even understand that and boy I get into some real interesting discussions about this very subject we had a meeting night before last of people who were rebelling against this uh, coronavirus stuff. And I could get off on a subject of that, and some of you may know or may not. There is no test for coronavirus, number one. And number two, the test that they claim in that they're doing can apply to multiple different types of viruses they cannot determine specifically that that is addressing to the coronavirus 19. And then when they stick that long Q-tip up your nose, boy, and I'm telling you, for those of you who've had that, it hurts. But what the intent to do in that is to, bake, uh, to break the membrane, protective membrane between the upper part of your sinus and the brain so that your brain will be infected. The purpose of all of this coronavirus stuff is to get people sick to benefit the pharmaceutical and on and on and on it goes. And I don't want to go much down further down this trail. But my point is this, folks, we're being duped. Oh, yeah. We're being lied to. We're being manipulated. Yeah, we're being duped. Beyond measure. This whole thing is predicated upon fear. And my Bible tells me, Jesus said, Fear not, 366 times in Scripture. That's one for every single day and leap year. We're <laughs> not to be that. a fearful people. That's right. Good thinking, Ron. I didn't think about that. Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break here. Uh, this is a good time for us. We're going to come back. We'll pick up. Uh, we'll continue on the 12 presumptions of the court. Uh, Ron Gibson, constitutional lawyer here. Uh, always great to have him on the show. Ron, why don't you give out any contact information where people can find out more about you and more about your work before we go on to this first break here, my friend. Okay. My, for those of you who want to contact me, my phone number is five, four, one, six, two, one, five, five, four, eight. That's five, four, one, six, two, one, five, five, four, eight. Very good. My email address. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Is D R I T E C R G at hotmail dot com. Okay, I'm typing it in the chat room now. There you go, folks. If you want to reach out to Ron, those that's the way to do it. Okay, Ron, we're going to go ahead and uh, put you on hold here. You'll be able to hear me while I'm on hold. I will take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back on the other side with constitutional lawyer Ron Gibson here on Montana Gazette Radio. Thanks so much for joining us here. It's MontanaDailyGazette.com, MontanaDailyGazette.com. I'm your host, James Knight. We'll be back after these brief messages. If you like classic cars, exceptional service, and a money-back guarantee, then the corner shop in beautiful downtown Kalispell is the place for you. 
Whether it's an oil change, engine diagnostic, suspension work, or brakes all around, the Kona Shop has you covered. With expert technicians and a free consultation on all services, you can't go wrong with the Kona Shop. Did I mention the classic cars? While you are waiting for your expert service to be performed, take a stroll through the showroom to see Kalispell's smoothest collection of classic cars. The Corner Shop is conveniently located at 1212 South Main, just south of the courthouse. The Corner Shop is open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. till 5 p.m., so drop by for an appointment or call 755-7777. That's 755-7777. The Corner Shop. Cal spells full service auto repair facility. PatriotPrepared.com carries the leading brands of storable food from Legacy and Heaven's Harvest. Patriot Prepared. Our name says it all. We're dedicated to empowering you to be self-reliant and confident in any circumstance. Whether you want to be prepared in the event of an emergency or you're an outdoor sports enthusiast, PatriotPrepared.com has prepackaged meals and kits for your entire family. Legacy, Heaven's Harvest are known for high-quality, great-tasting, GMO-free, nutritious food with no chemical preservatives. Simple to prepare, easy to store, gluten-free and organic high-quality nutrition options with a 25-year shelf life. You can't beat the feeling of being food secure when you need it most. So go to PatriotPrepared.com right now to pick up your supply of high-quality storable food for your family because it makes good sense to be prepared. That's PatriotPrepared.com. Okay, folks, PatriotPrepared.com for all of your storable food and survival food needs and other things as well. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm hearing now that toilet paper is starting to, to uh, run out again. They're only allowing, I think, one uh, package per person here at the local uh, stab, the local grocery store. And um, gee whiz, who, who the heck knows what's going to happen in the immediate future? I mean, I, I think the long-term plan is pretty well laid out, but... Gee whiz, the next couple of two, three weeks or six weeks until the end of the year could be pretty crazy. Don't know. Uh, but if you're concerned about that, go to PatriotPrepared.com. That's PatriotPrepared.com. And you can pick up some long-term storable food, stoves, water filtration, all different kinds of things there. Check it out. And, and the, uh, all the, the um, support of that website immediately goes here to support this broadcast. And we do appreciate that. Okay, we're going to bring uh, we're gonna bring our guest, Ron Gibson, back on the line. He's talking about the 12 presumptions of the court and uh ron thanks so much for hanging out with us after the break my friend we appreciate you sticking around not a problem okay we're gonna go ahead and pick it right back up if i think here on my sheet here we are at um i think number four the presumption of immunity i believe that's what it is go ahead ron over to you okay well number four is the presumption of immunity <clears throat> is <clears throat> the key members of the private bar guild in the capacity of a public official acting as judges, prosecutors, magistrates who have sworn a solemn public oath in good faith are immune from personal claims of injury and disability. Now, I want to stop there a minute. What did that just say? That they have made it now so that they are immune from any, any prosecution. They can do all the damage they want to do to you and your property and your lives and your family, and then they're claiming, well, we're, we're immune. Well, that's a presumption that is not true. There is a way to sue judges and attorneys, but they will never do it on their own. They do none of their own house cleaning. They do none of their own discipline. They leave that up to you, and then they will try to string it out to where you just get discouraged and quit, and then they go back to business as usual. I'm telling you, folks, we need to wake up in this country because if we don't, the intent of the attorneys and the bar association to divest you of your money, your rights, and your property, that's a mandate. 
the, the Bar Association on two occasions, the American Bar Association and the National Bar Association, one in 1922, I think it was, according to my record, and another one in the 50s, joined the Communist Party. That's what this is. Then they even put out a publication. Called, it's called the Lawyers Bar Guild, and it's affiliated with the Communist Party. Still and to this day, given two other pardon. Still to this day, they're affiliated with the Communist. Are they haven't have they ever disavowed their? Have they ever disavowed that back back way back when? Have they ever taught walk that back or disavowed their relationship with the Communist Party, Ron? Or not no, yet? No, no. No, they're still practicing that that concept, and they adopted the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. And the first one on that list, if for those of you who've ever read the, the ten presumptions or the ten uh, planks of the Communist, is is to do away with private property. And that's what an attorney's part of his mandate is. This, I've had a more oh boy, you're mistaken. You don't understand what we do. That's the whole thing. I do understand what you do. And what I'm telling you, it is not to your and I's best interest. The injury or liability, unless openly challenged, and their oath and demand the presumption, if not, the, the presumption stands that the members of the private bar guild, uh, as public trustees acting as judges, prosecutors, magistrates, are immune from personal accountability for their actions. In other words, folks, all this stuff that I'm sharing with you here this morning, and you're ever in a situation to where you're before a court or a prosecutor or whatever, you need to stand up and speak up. You object. You challenge these things. And I pray to God that you get a copy of this. You can go to the Internet and get a copy of this called the 12 Presumptions of the Court. But we need to speak up, and most people are scared to death of courts, and that's a tragedy because, in essence, we are their boss. They are to work for us, but we have allowed the table to be turned 180 degrees, and then because of, of an impure heart, then, in essence, what we have is what, we're, what they have is what we're getting because we're allowing it. We sit back and we do nothing. I don't want to get involved. Well, Boy, that, what can I do? Well, the family court's you know, the worst, Ryan. Kind of the, the family court, the family court is the absolute worst. The family courts where they take people's children without due process. We've had them numerous people on the on the program here. I think you know I do a lot of that work on my other show, and they've they've been told by the family court judges we're not going to allow the Constitution in this courtroom, or you you're not going to bring the Constitution in this courtroom because they're not constitutional courts. That's why they don't they don't want the they don't want their their fraudulent court tainted by the Constitution, which is the real true essence of the law. They don't want that out there because that that, that it reveals their corruption. The Constitution reveals all their corruption is what well, it does. Well, Jim, th there's a counter to that, and that's where you stand up and you rebut that statement on the basis. Then you have to excuse yourself, Your Honor, because you took a constitutional oath. So what are you doing sitting on the bench? Well, they don't listen. That's the problem. He has no alternative in that to make a statement because then he's prejudiced your case. So, you know, we have to learn to speak up. That's the point I'm trying to make here. We need to stand up and speak up and take a step forward. You know, my Bible says that, you know, expose sin right where it's at. And the Bible says if we do that, God will honor it. And boy, I mean to tell you, I've had a lot of success of that. Not every case, because you get these belligerent judges and prosecutors who their only intent is harming people and taking their property and their money. Okay, let's go on. Number five, the presumptions of summons. First of all, folks, let me share with you what a summons is. In any court action, when there is an action brought before the court, there are two documents that you will receive, and they will be presented to you by a process server at the same time. One of them is a summons, and the other one is a complaint. 
the the complaint. First of all, go back to the summons. The summons really is no more than an invitation. It is not a demand. Did you hear what I said? It's an invitation. They want you to step into their jurisdiction. The second part of it is, is the complaint is what they're alleging, alleging that you have done or not done, depending upon what the situation is, and on those. And you can address that issue by refusing to enter in to their court. I had a judge tell me one time, well, you're just going to get a default on that. And I said, fine. I said, no, I demand the, the jurisdiction for you to provide on the record the jurisdiction. They can't because the defendant has to be the one to give the court jurisdiction. Hey, what was that again now? The, the well, defendant they don't like it. What the defendant has to get you I mean they can't they don't I mean then they don't have jurisdiction over you unless you grant them jurisdiction over you? Is that kind of what you're saying? That is that's absolutely correct, James. Now you have the picture. It's presumed by us that the court has jurisdiction because they call themselves a court. All that is a private club. You're not part of that unless you volunteer to be in the part of that club. Let me share a court case with you. If you folks of you, you might want to write this down, look it up. It's on the Internet. But I do a lot of research, but I've used it in several of my cases. And that is the issue of City of Dallas versus Mitchell. Very interesting. In that case, the court stated, and I quote, our rights don't come from government. Our rights come from our creator. And we are not subject to government rules and regulations unless, here's this little word, unless we volunteer to be subject to those jurisdictions. Hello? So that's court precedence that in Dallas versus Mitchell. Dallas versus Mitchell says clearly... I'm that you only they only have rights over you if you give them rights. That is, can you repeat that one more time? That for me? is correct. That is correct. That's why people need to learn a little bit and shut that television off a little bit and get on the computer or go to the law library and just learn your basics, folks. You don't have to know everything about law, but you better have a basic knowledge to know when your rights are being violated. The federal courts have said over and over, if you don't know your rights, you don't have any rights. And it, like I said earlier, it isn't because those rights aren't there for you to claim and to exercise. It's the very fact that you don't know anything about it. And that for those kinds of people are easy to manipulate. My people That's perish. That's what we're talking about here this morning. My people perish for lack of knowledge, Ron. That comes to my mind. My well, people amen. perish for That's lack of knowledge. Right from right from our bible isn't it for lack of knowledge knowledge acquiring knowledge and properly applied is wisdom wisdom properly applied is positive and constructive results that's how it works so okay let's go on the 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 summons is an invitation and is that by a by custom, a summons unrebutted stands, and therefore one who needs a court is presumed to accept the position of the defendant, juror, witnesses, and the jurisdiction of the court. Like I said, if you're a defendant, then that's the one, and the court, if, if jurisdiction is challenged, and you go into a court and they're claiming that you're, they're going to charge you with this or that or whatever, you always, and boy, I remember in law school, there's our instructor over and over and over and over and over said, always challenge jurisdiction. He said, because 99% of the time that that entity or individual claiming that you have to do this or you can't do that does not have the jurisdiction to tell you that or to force you to do anything. And I have found that to be absolutely true. 
it's like getting back this coronavirus thing. The 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 governors have no authority to impose a restriction on you, the private individual. None. Zero. When are we going to wake up? And when are we going to stand up? I went to a meeting the other night, and the people that are tired of this, and I mean, it's a huge room, and I was asked to speak. Man, I mean, to tell you what, there was standing room only in that thing. People standing clear outside the doors even. They're sick to death of this government intervention into their life, and I'm sure that is true of most of your listeners here this morning. But I'm telling you, folks, it isn't going to cure itself. You're going to have to take a stand, and that's what we're doing here, and that's happening across the nation. So start asking around and get involved and start doing something about it. Well, on that, Because if you don't, there's more, there's more negative stuff to come your way. And it's coming. Well, on that note, I just want to make okay. a quick program note, fellas. Uh, Ammon Bundy is going to be with me here on December 1st. I talked to him this morning. It's a Tuesday show, a week from this coming Tuesday. So tune in for that with, for Ammon Bundy because he's, he's got arrested a couple of times standing up against this mask mandate. And it's him and people like Ron and people here in the Flathead Valley and across the country that are going to bring, take this country back. Uh, it's not the people sitting you know, uh, in, in, in the state capital, believe me, they're not, they're not, they don't have your best interest. All right, Ron, we're going to go ahead and continue here to number six, the presumption of custody. Go right ahead. Yes. The presumption of custody is that the custom is a summons or a warrant of arrest unrebutted stands. Therefore, the one who attends the court is presumed to be the thing and therefore liable to be detained in custody or by a custodian. What's a custodian? A custodian, one that controls something, has possession of the right to. This includes the legal, the dead legal fiction of the person. Notice capital letters. You know that you are not looked upon as a flesh and blood individual. You are looked upon as a corporate entity by virtue of the capital letters that's used relative to your daily lives, your driver's license, your social security, your banking statements, your credit cards, your electrical bill, ta-da, 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 ta-da. We are looked on as a human being, as a dead entity, so they created a new you by using the same letters that your name has, but put them all in capital letters. And I did a law class on that here Oh, it's been about two years ago now. Man, the people were shocked at what happened relative to our rights and our property, including our children. So, you know, let's 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 stand up, folks. So anyway, the person, the corporate government rules and regulations are written for the custodian and may only lawfully hold custody of property and things, not flesh and blood soul uh, possessing uh, a being unless this presumption is openly challenged and rejected of the summons or at the court the presumption stands as that you are a thing or property see that's what they consider you to be under their presumptions you're not a flesh and blood flesh and blood has rights property has no rights things have no rights that's the basis that they function and therefore lawfully able to be kept in custody by the custodian in other words if you don't rebut that and they put you in that position and you don't stand up and rebut it and challenge the jurisdiction of it they can hold you there forever without doing anything and they're beginning to do that people going to jail with no charge Bundy's that uh, James was just talking about was arrested as a political prisoner because they stood up for their rights. And I'm telling you what, folks, I don't know how many of you know about the Bundy's, but boy, they're heroes. I said, stand and I salute those family for them standing up because they stood up for all of us. Sure did. Sure did. I was right down there with them, too. I'm telling you. They're great people. I, I know their whole family oh, just man. about. The same, the same thing with LaVoy Finnegan. 
You know, they murdered that man. They literally murdered him. It was an execution. And uh, we won't get into any more of that, but I'll tell you what. Well, you're right. We, we, we better start paying attention. You're okay. Right. Number seven, the presumption of the court of guardians is the presumption that you may be listed as a resident, a word of the local government area, and even listed on your passport, the letter P. You are a pauper and therefore under the guardianship power of the government as an agent of the court of guardians. Unless this presumption, again, is openly challenged uh, to demonstrate that you are both a general guardian and a general executor, then in this matter, which is a trust uh, before the court, that the presumption stands and you are by default a pauper a lunatic, and therefore must obey the rules of the clerk of guardians. Wait, flex that out, Ron. That's confusing. That's a little confusing. Go over that one and break that down in the layman's terms for us. Presumption of the guardians. I I guess I, I – go ahead. If you could flesh that out for us, if you don't mind, Ron. Okay, you bet. The presumption of the guardian is whoever the court awards you to, whether it be the sheriff or the magistrate, deal or whatever on the thing, then in essence, you are considered to be under their jurisdiction unless you rebut this, unless you challenge the jurisdiction of it. They are considered guardians, and that right from the judge on down. What 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 is a guardian? It's someone that keeps uh, uh, custody of something that belongs to somebody else, isn't it? Yes. They have guardians of the court. So this guardian is taking care of and protecting this thing for the court's benefit, but the the court is the beneficiary. That's kind of what this means in real simple terms. Okay, very good. Thank you. Number eight, the presumption of the court of trustees. Boy, I'm telling you... If we were to go the full gamut, this is just 12 of the presumption. It's not all of them by any means. There's just 12 of them. The presumption of the Court of Trustees is that a member of the private bar guild presumes you accept the office of trustee as a public servant and government employee just by attending a Roman court. Let me read that again. The presumption of the court of trustee. What is a trustee? A trustee is one who oversees in the management of somebody else's property or asset. Okay? That you may be listed as a resident, a ward of the, oh, excuse me, I'm in the wrong one, of a trustee as a public servant. You now are looked upon not as a sovereign, but as a public servant of which they are manipulating and have control of. And the government employee, employee, by attending a Roman court, as such courts are always for public trustees by the rules of the bar guild and the Roman system. Unless this presumption is openly challenged again, to state that you are merely visiting by invitation. Remember what I told you about a summons, what a summons was? Right, it's an invitation. Five. Yeah, it's an invitation to show up. Yeah, by in, invitation, they're, they're coercing you to come into their jurisdiction. Come into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. Same principle. So you have to tell them, listen, I'm just here as a guest because you asked me to be here. I don't grant you any... Uh, a special uh, 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 rights over me uh, just because I came here. I came here by your invitation as a guest, and that's all I'm ever going to be while I'm here as no. a guest. Is that right or no? Well, you 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 want to you want to reword that a little different, Jim. Okay. When you are summons to the court, two things you can do: you can write across the summons, "I do not consent to these proceedings," and I do not 
except to enter into any contract with the court and then sign your name. Do it in red letters, catechlar, across the face of the summons. Then go to the court, and when they call your name, you want to stand up and say, Your Honor, I'm here to clear the record, to correct the record. Do not say when he calls your name, Here, Your Honor, you have just given them jurisdiction. You tell the court that you are there to correct the record that you are not the true party in interest who was summons to court by the invitation is always in capital letters. You are not that entity because it's not a person. They claim it's a person, but it's not as we know it. It's not a flesh and blood individual. So here they are. Now you tell the court that I'm not the true party in interest. Therefore, from my standpoint as a flesh and blood man or woman, I don't give this court jurisdiction to assume or presume that I'm this capital letter entity. And turn around and walk out of the court because you just stripped the court and the judge of any and all jurisdiction. And, and, and I want to clear this up right now, Ron. I just want to make this plain and simple to people. They are fully aware of what you're saying right here. What you're saying here is not a secret to them. They know all about the scam. They know all about the con and the fraud yeah, because they take a secret oath. So it's not like it's they're, like there's attorneys yeah. going to be going, oh, I'm, I'm shocked what Ron's saying. No, they're not shocked. They took an oath for crying out loud. This is a plan. This isn't, a, this isn't an aberration. Oh. This is a guide. This is a playbook. <laughs> they devised this plan. You're absolutely right. There's no surprise to them. This is the game and the rules that they play by. Boy, oh boy. Number nine, the presumption of government acting in two roles, ex executor and beneficiary. What's wrong with that statement? This Conflict of interest, isn't there? The presumption of government acting in two roles as executor and beneficiary. What's wrong with that? Conflict of interest. You cannot be both. You either have to be an executor, which is the manager of it, the custodian of it, however you want to define it. The beneficiary is the one who owns the property or for the benefit of. That's why it's called beneficiary. But they assume the role of both. Is that that the matter at hand, the private bar guild appoints the judge magistrate in the capacity of executor, while the prosecutor acts in the capacity of the beneficiary. Boy, you talk about a shell game. You don't have a chance. And the people <laughs> stand there don't have a, they, they don't have a clue what just happened. It's all rigged. That's why I teach law. It's rigged. The whole thing's That's rigged. That's why I do what I do. There is such a sham going on and, and the violation of people's rights and property. I can't even adequately describe it. The prosecutor acts as the capacity of the beneficiary of the trust or the in the current matter, unless the presumption, again, is openly challenged to demonstrate you are both a general guardian and a general executor of the matter, the trust before this court, the presumption stands as you are by default the trustee, therefore must obey the rules of the executor, the judge or the magistrate. If you don't speak up, folks, that's what happens. Wow. Simply amazing. Number 10, the presumption of an executor de son tort. And if you're wondering what a de son tort is, that is one who takes the position that they have a right to take control of somebody else's property without authority. And usually it has to do with with a dead person's estate. Not in all cases, but that's most oh, generally oh, 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 oh. where that term is used. Ron, hold on a, a second. It's a French term. 
I have I have on my sheet presumption of agent and agency. Did you just is that just a different way you produ- you produce it you pronounce it a different way? Did you did you use a, a, a Latin? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I just use come by my own words. Right on. Whatever, rather than just okay. exactly. It's presumption right? of agent and agency for, to, to for in simpler terms is the presumption that under contract law you have expressed and granted authority to the judge and the magistrate. Okay, go ahead, Ron. Sorry, go ahead and pick up. So here we are. Therefore, the judge and magistrate assumes the role of the true executor and has a right uh, to have you arrested, detained, fined, or forced into a psychiatric evaluation, and that's what they do. Unless this presumption is openly challenged, not only by asserting one's position as executor, as well as questioning the judge or the magistrate in seeking to act as an executor de tort, the presumption stands and the judge or magistrate of the private bar guild may seek the assistance of the bailiff or the sheriff to arrest their false claims. Most arrests, folks, are on a false claim. Have you ever noticed when somebody gets gets arrested for one thing, they throw a whole truckload of other additional charges on them? Have you ever noticed that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Guy guy gets a speeding ticket. Well, we found a a rifle, you know, in his car. Well, we have a right to have a rifle, but you know, and they found an ounce of of, of drugs in it, and they found a knife in there. And they found a pair of scissors. All of that will be uh, uh, listed as part of the charges. Almost lose sight of the real reason why they started doing what they do to start with. Amazing, just amazing. And here's here's something I want to I want to also point. I want I want to stop for one second. Quick, quick comment, folks. If you have an attorney, like your defense attorney, is never going to point out these things that Ron's saying today when he says, "Well, you need to stand up and object." Your bar attorney will never reveal these to you and have you go against their own organization. Your, your, your attorney, I don't care, if, unless you get a lawyer like Ron, who's not part of the bar, your, your bar attorney is not going to give you the tricks on how to foil his own organization that he's taking a secret oath to. I mean, let's just use our brains, folks. Then, we, you're not going to give strangers you know, the combination to the key to your front door. I mean, you know, because everything's mayhem if you do that. They're not going to give you the secrets to the the keys to get inside behind this and defend yourself. Not your bar attorney. Your bar attorney won't do it. Why would they? Well, you bring up a very valid point, Jim, is that that's exactly right. They're all in it together. They're all in cahoots with each other to play the game that they play. And unless you know... And, folks, it's real simple. Let, let me bring this down to a real simple thing that you can do. Is always, always, always challenge jurisdiction. Because the rules say that once jurisdiction is challenged, the court must validate the jurisdiction on the record. In other words, they have to validate the fact that the charges being brought are, are fit the crime or the crime fits in or whatever or the charge or whatever. But you always want to challenge jurisdiction. And the rules say also, and there are court cases galore on this, that you can challenge jurisdiction at any time in a case. Even if it's on appeal, you can still challenge the jurisdiction. Because the rules say that nothing can go forward, no rulings can be made by the court until jurisdiction is established. And if you haven't given them jurisdiction, then there is no jurisdiction. I hope you caught that. Many, many, many men are in jail today because they did not challenge the jurisdiction. They're there by their own willingness to be there or their own ignorance to be there however you want to define it go ahead jim no uh, no i'm just going to say we i mean we tried sad the sad fact the matter is we've been so dumbed down ron and they haven't taught us this stuff 
in school and our parents don't know about it. And, you know, I mean, so this is just, this is, this is information that's been, been buried. And I mean, you know, not necessarily hidden, but not promoted. I mean, you can find that on the internet, but no one promotes this stuff and no one talks about this because their whole, if everybody knew what we're talking about today, if everybody that, that in the country knew this, their whole entire thing would crumble. Their whole system would fall apart overnight. If everybody started going into court and doing what That's you're correct. saying now, their whole entire sham would fall apart. They, they couldn't stand. They could not withstand it if people would just go in and exercise the rights that, they, that we have. Right? They, their founding fathers didn't, didn't put us in a position where, and I want to bring this up again. I brought it up 10 times, but in a position where we have to get a permit to go fishing and a permit to go hunting and get permission from some administrative government to do these things. This is not how our founding fathers wanted this to be. We wanted, we're, the, we're, the, we're the sovereign. We're the ones that are free. They work for us. Sorry, Ron, I get off on a tangent here, but these people, these crooks and criminals, they're everywhere. And I'm, I'm tired of these people be, be, per, performing criminal acts right out in the open, and no one ever does anything hardly, because I guess because we're just too ignorant. Well, we're not going to be ignorant much longer. We're going to continue to bring this information out here on this show, pass this video around, get everybody knowledgeable about these 12 presumptions of the court, because if you, if you figure out what they are and you go into court, you can foil these scoundrels. Go ahead, Ron. That, that's true. I want to do a little sidebar, Jim, if I can, for a moment. Of course. Uh, I wrote, I've, I've written two books. Uh, one of them is What You Need to Know About Land Patents. Uh, if you want to bring your true title forward in your name, that's a process to get it done. I do that for people. I teach people how to do it. The other book that I wrote was called You're Not a Slave. And in that, I prove that we're not obligated to pay property tax. And in doing the research of putting my book together, I found it very interesting. I found nowhere in law, and I'm going to address another part of this in just a moment, to where anyone has the right to dictate to somebody else to go and tax a, a private property that belongs to you and I, the individual. And I do a lot of research, and I'm good at it. I find nowhere in law. In fact, going back to the patent issue, the patent is the true title to your land. And in that, when you go back to the congressional hearings on that, you will find that the property under an allodial title land patent was to never be taxed uh, probably by way of property tax. Because it's an allodial title. An allodial title means owing to no one, to no lord nor superior. Well, if that's the case, then who got the authority? I want to see that because I've spent 48 years searching for it, and I can't find it. I've got some very good researchers in our mining district that uh, are excellent researchers. I mean, these guys don't miss nothing. They can't find it either. So I asked the government and the tax department, show me your authority. Because if you read your constitution, both your, your federal constitution and the state constitution, nowhere in any of those allows the state to assess an ad valorem tax on private property. Absolutely nowhere. So I just bring that up for general information. Okay, number 11, the presumption of incompetence is a presumption that you are at least ignorant of the law, therefore incompetent to present yourself and argue properly. Therefore, the judge, magistrate, as executors, has the right to have you arrested, detained, fined, forced into psychiatric evaluation unless this presumption is openly challenged to the fact that you know your position as executor and beneficiary uh, and a actively rebuke the object of any contrary presumption, then it, then it stands at the time of the pleading that you are incompetent, then the judge or magistrate can do what they need to keep you in, obe in you obedient. So we're say, you're saying we're, they presume us to be incompetent when we walk in the door, 
they presume us to be ignorant and incompetent automatically until we let them know, hey, listen, we're not incompetent. We know the law. And, and so don't, 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 uh, don't characterize us that way. I mean, they, they literally presume that you're incompetent when you walk in the door, is what you're telling me. That is correct. I don't understand why this has been going no, on so damn no, long no, and no one's been st- standing no. up and re- revolting against this crap. Please go ahead. I want to share a little short story with you. Take just a minute. We had a meeting set up our mining district. I'm the chairman of the largest mining district in the United States. The mining district is an independent government by law. And uh, so anyway, we, uh, it was arranged by one of the county commissioners, uh, a lady by the name of Sandy Casanelli, and sharp, sharp, sharp gal. And anyway, she came out to meet us. There was about 15, 18 of us, whatever it was. And as we started up the step to the courthouse, she's ahead of me, and she turned around real quick, and she put her hand on the upper part of my chest and just stopped this dead cold. And she's holding her hand there. And she said, I need to tell you guys something. And still holding her hand on the upper part of my chest, she turned around and she pointed from one end of that courthouse to the other. And she said, everybody in that building is scared to death of you minors. And I said, what? She said, that's a fact. And I said, why? I mean, I'm dumbfounded at the statement. She says, because they all know that you guys know the law. And I'm telling you, you could have knocked me over with a feather at that statement, because we do. But I never thought that it would have that kind of an effect relative to the people in the county building there, where they're projecting to know the law and exercise the law and everything else. That's nothing but lies and distortion about that fact. But anyway, I just mentioned that because when, when you know the law, they don't want nothing to do with you. They want you to get out of their face. Number 12, the presumption of guilt is a presumption that as is presumed to be a private business meeting of the Bar Guild, you are guilty whether you plead guilty or not plead guilty. Therefore, unless you either have previously prepared an affidavit of truth and a motion to dismiss with extreme prejudice into the public record or call a the mirror, then the presumption is that you are guilty and the private bar guilt can hold you until a bond is prepared to generate the amount of the guilt wants to profit from you. Hold on a minute, Ron. The Constitution so says you, that I'm, just... I'm innocent until proven guilty. That's what the Constitution says. I'm innocent until proven guilty. Isn't that right? Don't we have a presumption of innocence? That is correct. That's correct. And this just shows you this presumption of the bar is 180 degrees from that, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. And here's the other problem. Under the Administrative Procedures Act, it was enacted unlawfully by Congress on June 11, uh, 1946, is the fact that it turned it, it, it was implemented for the purpose of, of circumventing the Constitution and common law. Now it becomes a corporation or part of the corporation for the sake of implemented administrative procedure in lieu of common law. That's where you come in to your statutes and codes. So all of the states had to convert from uh, sovereign states to territorial corporations by virtue of that act from June 11th until 1954. Oregon was one of the last states to incorporate and implement. That gave them time of which to draw up all of these statutes and codes. Folks, statutes and code is not law. It's corporate rules and regulations. And you're not a party to that um, of that corporation unless you volunteer, as the, the city of Dallas versus Mitchell case stated. What are we doing volunteering? We volunteer for stuff. We put the noose around our neck, and we wonder why they're hanging us up from the tree. Yep. 
We are. We are. <laughs> but anyway, I just a little bit of my own analogy here. But what I'm trying to do, folks, I hope it makes you matter in health. And I hope that you stand up and get together and do something about your situation where you live, because we all face the same dilemma. Well, and this is really starting to happen. This this uh, mask and and trying to separate everybody for Thanksgiving, no more than six people. People are not buying that for one minute. And boy, I mean, it's hot and heavy here in Oregon. Yeah, man. Well, I'd lo let's open up the phone lines That's here, Ron. That's what they want to do. Can we open up the phone lines if for calls? They will take, if they'll take control of you and you allow to take control here, then there's more stuff coming. You can bet your last dollar on it. They're coming. Oh, yeah. You have a responsibility to stop it. Indeed. Okay, Jim, then yield the floor. Uh, if you, uh, are you okay with taking phone calls, Ron? Is that okay? Can we can we have some calls come in? People you bet. have. Okay, so if you got if you got you bet. if you got questions for Ron Gibson, constitutional lawyer, uh, try to keep it on topic about you know it doesn't have to be about the twelve presumptions, but at least keep it within the legal realm, um, if you don't mind. Um, we don't want sports scores and stuff like that. Call five six three nine 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 three six one seven five six three nine 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 three six one seven if you want to call in here and talk to the one and only Ron Gibson. Ron, uh, while we're waiting for people to call in, if they have, if they do, uh, I want to talk, we touched on a little bit. I held up your book there, The Land Patent Titles. And, you know, what I've stated in this program before, and you can certainly, um, uh, you know, agree or disagree, but all rights really come back to property rights. Even even this whole mass thing and the, and the, and the, and the uh, virus, the, the, uh, uh, the vaccination thing, your body is your property. Either your body is your property, either your own individual body, people that are listening to this pro program, either your body is your property or it's the property of the government. Which one do you want it to be? Because if you listen to what they tell you, then you are saying, okay, so my body is your property. If you don't listen to what they tell you, you're taking a stand and going, my body is my property. I know that sounds like a crazy thing, but they're trying to actually get people to disavow their own ownership in their in their body. They're trying to get people to 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 disavow the ownership that they have in their own body, and they want the, people to believe that they have control over what you know, what mask you wear or what vaccine uh, you you put in your body. That's completely not how it's supposed to be, is it, Ron? We got a call coming in, so go ahead answer that question if you don't mind. Boy, boy, that is absolutely true. Let me say before we take the call, there's a maximum in law that is universal, and it is simply this. One can only claim jurisdiction over that which one creates. So you were talking about them claiming our body. They didn't create our body. God did. They didn't create, uh, you know, our children. God did. And on and on and on it goes. And I'm just saying that it's a very good principle to kind of write up on a little note, stick it on your refrigerator. One can only claim jurisdiction over that which one creates. The question is, what did they create? And when you look at it very hard, they didn't create anything except trouble. Yeah, That's exactly. Good at. Okay. Exactly. Well, okay, okay. folks. So uh, before I take the first call here, I'll just take them in order. They're coming in. Uh, the rules of the phone uh, system here, and I hate to have to say it, but you know, you don't have to agree with myself or with Ron. No problem there. Just be respectful. Don't be abusive. And don't use, you know, it's not a vulgar show. We don't use cur cursing language here. So if you can refrain from those things, ask away. We'll, we'll, bring our first, uh, we'll bring our first caller on here. Caller, thanks for calling into the show. Uh, you're live on the air. Please state your first name and what city or state you're calling from, please. This is uh, Judith. I'm calling from Liberty Lake, Washington. Hi, Judith from Washington. And I just like to ask. I just like to ask about maybe um, common law and reestablishing common law and common law courts, because as I see it, the current system is so corrupt that that it cannot correct itself. And I was wondering what he thought about that. There you go, Ron. What do you think about well, reestablishing? You bring up a very, go very good question. Uh, and, and comment. Uh, they're in the process now. It's, in fact, it's well into the process of establishing common law courts 
and for us to get back to true America. And uh, I heard the other day that one of the states already has a full-fledged common law court. Uh, there are others that are being constructed uh, as we speak, uh, because you're absolutely right. The corruption is so bad, folks, that it, it takes a full house cleaning. And Trump was absolutely correct when he said that he would drain the swamp. That swamp is so filthy that it, it it's heart-wrenching, the corruption that goes on within that, the satanic uh, activity that goes on in that, the backdoor deals that go on as a result of that. It's all affiliated with this corruption. So uh, I want that... to say Go ahead, something. Judith. Did oh, you have, go ahead. Did you have go a follow-up? Go ahead, Judith. I have a follow-up um, follow question. Um, how can we find out what states are currently involved in uh, creating these common law and common law courts? Do you know, Ron, is there a good resource for the common, uh, the movement? I'm trying to think of the name of it. Yes, I tell you what, send me an email and I'll, I'll get that information to you. Okay. We'll give you Thank Ron's, you so give you Ron's email. It. You're welcome. Uh, go ahead, Ron. Give out your email again one more time here for the folks that are that are listening. Judith, you okay. want to? You want to? Do you know? Do you have Ron's email, Judith? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you have it. Okay, but go ahead and give it out again, Ron. Thanks, Judith, no, for coming. No, oh, I okay. Don't. Okay, go ahead, Ron. Okay, it's D as in David, R as in Romeo, I as in ice cream, T as in Tom, E as in Echo, C as in Charlie. R as in Ron, G as in Gibson, at hotmail.com. Thank you so much. Thanks, Judith. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for calling. You're very welcome. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Hi. Okay. You know, I want to say to you, ma'am, thank you for inquiring about the common law court because it's only within common law that, that our rights are then exercised and protected. Under administrative uh, statutes and codes, you have no rights. You're guilty of everything. Well, she's so dropped you off. You only have permission. She's dropped off. So, uh, but but I'm sure she's listening in. She thanks you for that. Thanks thanks for that, Ron. Okay, so we've got another caller uh, okay. coming. Uh, for those of you who are asking about the sound, I've got the sound pretty well cranked up to the uh, loudest that I can crank it up here. Um, for uh, let's see here. Um, let's bring up. Okay. Maybe that'll help a little bit. I think, I think I've got it pretty much up the highs as I can go. Uh, all right, Ryan, let's take another call here and, um, we'll bring the caller on right now. Caller, you're live on the air. Thanks so much for calling in. Please state your first name and what state or city that you're calling from. Hey, my, my name's Steve. Good morning. Hey, Steve. Good morning. Uh, I'm in Chicago. Uh, my, me and my son are listening. Um, Thanks for listening. I watched a few videos from. Yeah, I, I watched a few videos from uh, Ron Gibson in the past, and I had a few questions about the social security number and uh, getting the state national passport. And as far as getting like the stars and the asterisks on the passport, does that have to do with anything? Do you know what exactly are those stars for? Do you know about that, Ron? Do you know about that? Um, can you repeat that question again one more time uh, for, for our listeners? And maybe. No, I was just wondering. I was wondering about uh, applying for a state national passport using your social security number, or do you recommend not even giving the social security number uh, when applying for the state national passport? Ron, are you familiar with the state well, national passport? Go first, ahead. Yes, I am. Uh, first of all, let's, let's go back a little bit. <clears throat> Under law, you and I are not even to have a, a social security number. If, and I've done an extensive amount of research on that. Uh, social security numbers are not ours. The card is not ours. It is given to government employees for the sake of on special assignment. That's what it says in the research that I've done on it. Now, we get it back to the presumption issue again. They're presuming because they want to get their hooks into your money 
is that you now are a government employee. That's why your name is in capital letters. They are now presumed to be a government entity. Therefore, you're doing work for the government. Well, there's evidence of that because they come and they steal your money through taxes and regulations. So uh, that's kind of how that that works. So the Social Security really has no place in any part of our identification, whether it be relative to a passport or not. So the numbers and stuff that they assign to that number or letter or any kind of insignia on the thing really is irrelevant simply because it does not lawfully apply. It legally applies, but not lawfully. Right, and there's a big difference between legal and lawful, uh, and people don't understand that. Let me bring the caller back on. <clears throat> caller, did that, did that answer your question, caller? Let me bring it back on here. Uh, yeah, pretty much. And I, I was still wondering about the stars on the passports, and if you guys even have those state national passports, personally. I don't have one personally. Do you know anything about the stars uh, on the run? What, what are you talking about with that? I don't know what significant that the stars represent. Uh, I've never really looked into that, so I'm not really uh, at liberty to to share what that is because uh, honestly, I, I I don't know. Well, it's fair enough. Sometimes okay. you know, I just heard that the diplomats and certain people have more stars than the average person. And I was yeah. just wondering if that had anything to pertain with nationals. Um, okay, well, I appreciate you guys uh, taking my call, and uh, God bless. Uh, thank, thank you, James and Ryan. Thank you for appreciate listening. You I appreciate you. Thanks for listening. You're welcome. Thank you for the call. Yeah, Ron. Um, you know, and, the, and here's the here's the great thing is that you know, I, I, people are starting to more than ever, you know, look into these things and. And, you know, wonder, you know, because, you know, and here's the thing. We see over the last three or four years, the, 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 the left has done nothing but try to take down this country. And now with this voting thing, they're trying to take down this country. Here's what I suspect, Ron. The reason they're fighting so hard is because when, 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 the, when all of this starts to come down and all their fraud and all the con that they've been pulling on everybody, the whole entire thing's going to be exposed, including... The court systems. The court system is one of the most corrupt organizations or institutions in this whole entire country. I mean, the amount of parents alone in family court that have their children taken from them without due process is it's a national tragedy. And it's happening every day, even today. It's happening today. This whole thing's got to be burned down to the ground and rebuilt again, where we are the ones that have the most rights, not the government. That, because that's the way it is right now. They've managed to flip everything around in reverse when it really should be the other way around. Well, but that was kind of the point that the lady made about the Constitution uh, and constitutional courts. That stops all of that garbage. And I want to get back to a comment that you just made about stealing our children and one thing or another. Those, the majority of those children that have been taken either through the court system or kidnapped, have to do with satanic sacrifices in the underground. And I don't know if people are aware or not, but there are literally hundreds and hundreds of underground facilities that they have overtaken of which they do their, their satanic rituals. Many people in Hollywood are involved in that. Many politicians were uh, taken a party to those uh, satanic sacrifices. These children are sacrificed uh, there and they drink the blood and all of the gruesome garbage that goes along with that kind of stuff and whatever. And they have rescued, as I understand it, the last count that I got over 52,000 children, but there are thousands and thousands that have been murdered and sacrificed for this, for this satanic worship. And it's still they're doing they're they're eliminating those. Uh, they had one east of uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, and they're blowing these facilities up. And the explosion was so great on the thing that it literally the federal courthouse or one of the courthouses there. I'm not sure which one it was in the county building from the shock uh, from these explosions. 
and they've done one in Bremerton, Washington. They've done some in California down the Bay Area. But there are literally hundreds of these underground. There's a huge one out of, I think, Golden, Colorado, of all of these underground facilities. One of them is over 22 miles uh, underground, a city, literally a city underground. And the American people was totally uh, naive to that stuff even going on. That's what Trump has meant by when he said he's draining the swamp and trying to stop the. Well, we better hope and pray he stays president because otherwise it's going to go back. Biden has already said it's all going to go back uh, to the stuff that that uh, is not to our best interests as a nation and as people of this nation. So, you know, you choose what you choose, but be careful what you choose. Well, so, I, li- I literally there's a lot of stuff going on. The American people. I usually hold all that. I mean, I'm not. I agree with what you're saying. I just, I'm not denying anything you said. I just usually, I usually keep those specific details out of the uh, out of the. You know, you're right. But you say what they do to children, and everything is just horrendous, folks. And I don't even report on the some of the stuff that goes on here because it's so, it's so, it's so graphic and ungodly that I don't even want to bring it on the air. But some of these things that Ron is saying here. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not that I am at all what he's saying. It's, it's bad, folks. It's bad. It's bad. Than you, it's worse than you could. Again, I've said this on my other program before. Think of the worst. Think of how bad you can possibly think it is. As worse as you can possibly imagine, it's worse. It's worse. It's worse than, it's worse than that. Believe me. It's much, it, it's, it's much worse. Indeed. Indeed. Um, well, let's, let's, uh, let's go back to, uh, let's go back to more legal type stuff ron and not that it, that i don't talk about this but i do on my other show all the time uh the the land patent title we were talking about how your rights you know your property rights the most important thing that you can do is in my view is one of the most important things you can do is you can get your 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 your, your land patent title your colloidal title brought up your alloidal title i should say brought up currently so ron and that's a big area of your and a lot of times a, a home is most people's biggest most persons, you know, their, their, their biggest investment and the, and the biggest thing that they have ownership in typically. Uh, and it's very important that you keep that, you know, in your family and, and, and in trust of your family for generations. But briefly go over, if you can, and I'll, I'll hold up the book again. Go over the land patent title for us, Ron, and, and what, not every step by step the way, but generally what do people need to do to get their land back to them in the, with the land patent title? I'll, I said, I'll hold your book up right now. Well, there's a process that is allowed by law, uh, and that comes directly from the patent. Uh, On every patent, it says it is hereby granted to the undersigned, to their heirs and assigns forever. And that forever word comes from the Bible. Uh, The Bible states in lectures where my people will inherit the land forever. They will possess the land forever, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and there's a provision, uh, and you can look it up in the Hooper versus Scheimer case, uh, to where we have a right as an assigned means that a person that owns property, and I don't mean it has to be paid off. I'm just saying that we're an owner of record. You bought a piece of property, and it's recorded in the county recorder's office that you are the owner of record. And because of that, you now, by the process laid out by law, you have to have a, a certified copy of the original land patent, and you have to have a, an unbroken chain of title. You have to show that you are an owner of record the first page or two from your warranty deed. There has to be a notice document in there, which I create for people if they have me do the process, and there's also has to be the legal document called the Certificate of Acceptance of the Declaration of Land Patent. And with that document, it has to be posted for 60 days, of which gives the public time to review it. And then at that point, you take it back to the recorder's office and have it recorded. Now you have right title and interest in the true title to the land. That means you're not subject to building codes. You're not subject to setbacks. You're not even subject to taxes. And that's the book that I wrote, You're Not a Slave. 
but they don't want to accept that, which is a criminal uh, uh, crime that's committed because they have to accept it simply because it's in law. The title of a patent is in law. When you, the person that received the land patent originally, got a document. It's called a letters patent. It's a one-page document. And that document there is not the title. It is the evidence of the title. That's right. The title is held, the title is held in law. Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2 of the United States Constitution. Also with the issuance of that patent is what accompanies that is a bundle of rights. And they're not just rights, they're vested rights. Vested right means that they're in law. They cannot be taken away. They cannot be altered. They cannot be diminished. They cannot be damaged in any way, shape, or form because it is also in the Constitution. And... Ron, look, we got a question. We got a question yeah. here from the. We got a question from the chat room. Ron, did you? Fin I'm sorry. Were you finished? I apologize. <laughs> no, go ahead. Okay, so the question is: uh, Ask Ron about the original Thirteenth Amendment banning anyone with a title of nobility from holding office in the United States. Do you know anything about that, Ron? I, I'm not really too. That's not my wheelhouse. Do you know about that? Yes, I do. Can you comment the original, on that? Uh, the, the 13th Amendment was, in fact, passed, but the Bar Association did not want that to be out because they wanted to be, be noticed as a person of nobility, that they were higher than the American public, that they were had more prestige, you know. And if you look around there the, in social conversation, oh, you're a doctor, oh, you're a lawyer. You know, or you're an attorney, like they're uh, ahead above all, all of the rest of us. And it was specifically introduced and passed, but it was hidden and still is, because if you go back and research the record, you'll find that it was passed. They cannot use Esquire behind their name. Esquire means that a person of nobility special interests, special rights, uh, special privileges, all of that. But they act like it now, even though the 13th Amendment is not listed on the constitutional uh, amendment. Folks, we've got about 20 minutes left here. If you want to call in and speak to Ron, 563-999-3617. 563-999-3617. I got another question from the uh, from the chat room, Ron. I think it's probably one that we're all wondering. The question is simply this: Please ask him what we can do to expose this. I think kind of the stuff we're doing now, right, Ron? And 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 everybody that's listening to this broadcast, passing this video around, or if you're a writer, listen to this video, write your own article, put it out on your blog site, create your own YouTube video. If you have a YouTube audience. Create your own YouTube video, put it out to your audience. If you have a Twitter following, tweet this information out, tweet this video out. It doesn't have to be my video. I don't get monetized anyway, so it doesn't really matter to me. I'm just looking to, uh, to get the information out. So just put this information out to, in front of as many eyeballs as possible. Uh, Ron, is there anything, anything additional that I missed? Well, yes. Uh... First of all, that, that's a very good question, and I appreciate the person asking that. Uh, what you can do is to get start gathering people together on the base. See, we all have a common bond, and that is we want to be free, and we want government the hell out of our life. There's a purpose for a lawful government, but there is no purpose for an unlawful government, and that's what we're dealing with here. But the point that I wanted to bring out on this whole thing, I'm doing a law class that I teach. I teach four law classes a month. Uh, but uh, this Sunday night, I will be doing a law class, uh, a continued class on the power of the sheriff. And uh, very, very interesting. 
And what we're doing here locally is that we're trying to get our local sheriffs of each one of the counties to declare that they are constitutional sheriffs. Now, there's a lot of resistance of the sheriffs out there for this. They don't want to make a wave. They want to get a paycheck Friday night. They want to do what they do and go home and have dinner and whatever. But let me explain a little bit about why the sheriffs are so important to accomplish what you're talking about. Simply, the sheriff is a constitutional position that we, the people, are to vote on because they're our only firewall between us and legislation that comes down from the state and or from court decrees that are to our detriment, okay? Now, if a sheriff's position that we elect is a constitutional uh, uh, office and we elect a sheriff and he takes this oath that we're talking about, he's not a bar member, remember, but he does take his official oath. At that point, he is duty-bound. He is duty-bound with a fiduciary duty of which protect you and I and our rights and our property, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What happens, though, is when we elect the sheriff and he puts on his sheriff suit and he takes his oath of office, he then acts, he changes hats. He was elected with a a constitutional authority on his head. He then takes that off, lays it down, and puts on an administrative hat. And then he turns around and he starts serving people with evictions on foreclosure and tax foreclosure and any of this and the whole list of gamut of stuff that's involved in that. He has now violated his oath of office in the most egregious way that can be done because he has deceived and he has dishonored his oath of office and his position and trust with the people. And what we're doing is we're working with sheriffs to get them to understand what the true responsibility of a sheriff is. And 99% of them, if not all of them, do not know. And I've been asked to, to teach sheriffs what the law is and their deputies. And I'll be glad to do that, but it has to be done because otherwise they don't know what the law is. They're presuming that what the state corporations have put out there under statutes and codes are law. And I can tell you in 48 years of law, that is not the case. That is not law. That's corporate rules and regulations. So we've got to get back number one, to a constitutional sheriff. But the other half of that equation, folks, is we better step up to the plate and support him. And we better let him know we support him, and we support him in mass. Because otherwise you're going to leave him out there to take every shot from every bureaucrat coming down there. Uh, Boy, how what a bastard he is, because now he's a constitutional sheriff rather than an administrative agent. No, I, I'm, I'm, I've had Richard Mack ahead, on the yeah. show. I've had Richard Mack on the show numerous times, and I'll probably give him a call later on, see if he wants to come back on next week. Uh, p- p- people are asking, Ron, where to get your book if people want to get, you know, and I probably should. We should have worked this out before. What we'll do, uh, let them know where we can go now. What I'll do is I'll put something up on my website. I'll put up, a, I think I have a merchant thing on my website. I don't really know. I don't go on an, a whole lot to check into that. But I, I know I know on my food website I can put it up there. So what we'll do is, uh, unless you have a place that you want people just to email you right now, if someone wants a copy of the book, are you set up, Ron, as far as uh, you just probably take a check uh, or something if someone wants to just send you yes. a check and you send them a copy? Check or, check, or, check or money order or PayPal. But, Jim, I need to correct my address because I moved. They sold the building where my son and I had offices there oh. before. So let me give you my new address. Please do. It's Ron Gibson, and it's 11 North, just an N with a period on it, uh, Peach Street, like a fruit, like you eat a peach. And that's Medford, Oregon, 97501. That's Ron Gibson, 11 North Peach Street, 
Medford, Oregon, M-E-D-F-O-R-D, Oregon, 97501. There you go, folks. That's the address right there to uh, send. Uh, and then um, I um, would they just email you and get like if they, I know you have two books, Ron. I don't I don't remember how much the land patent. I know you that was a complimentary copy when you came here to town for me. So I don't even know how much they cost. Uh, but do you have uh, do you have a price list or something where people can or they just email you and let you know? And then. And, well, the, Go ahead. Yeah, if you're interested in the books, but they're forty-five dollars each, that includes the mailing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the books are loaded with case law, and I I wrote the books on the basis of research, not just what I think or maybe this or maybe that, because I didn't want somebody saying, "Oh, Ron, that's just your opinion." Everything that's in there, you can go to the bank on as far as the law is concerned, and it's loaded. So I wanted people to understand it just isn't me saying this stuff. 45 bucks is really, no, ne- right, you should be charging more, Ron. 45 bucks for what you put, the information you pack into these things, man. I mean, I think just to take the course, it costs like 150, 160 bucks. And that was like five years ago when you were here in Kalispell. This is gold, folks. $45, hours, this is gold. I mean, you're you're talking about taking your property back and your whole entire house. If your house is worth a couple hundred, 300 grand, 400 grand, Forty-five bucks is pretty cheap. It's it's a small price to pay, <laughs> that's for sure. Anyway, and the other book, Ron, is uh, what's the other book, Ron? That's the patent patent book. And give you this, give us the name of the other book again. The one book for the patent is what you need to know about land patents. Right. Land patents with an S. The other book is you're not a slave. That has to do with property tax. I prove there to where you're not obligated to pay a property <laughs> to pay property taxes because it's an allodial title. So what what is okay? So Ron and, and we got we've got about well, I don't know what do we got like about ten about ten or twelve minutes left here. Uh, let me see if there's anybody that's called in on the phone here first. Okay, uh, folks, if you want to call in, you want to get a quick call in real quick. We've got a few minutes left. It's 563-999-3617. What's the first thing the person listening to this program here? Let's assume that we have an audience full of people that have an absolutely zero idea about what we've just talked about. It's all 100% new to them. Now, I know that's not true, but let's just presume this. We talk about the 12 presumptions of the court. Let's presume that for this show. What, what can people do today? The first thing they can do today, if they only did one item a day until they got all this stuff reversed, because you can back out of some of these things, you know, you, if, knowledge is a, certainly the key, but what can someone do to start taking their life back away from the, from the, from the, from the government and the, and the, and the administrative courts, <laughs> administrative rule, and put it back to their own personal rule? What, what can people do right away today? The first thing you would recommend they do to start that process, Ron? Well, one of the things that we have found that works real well, and that is start asking around in your community of somebody who has at least some reasonable knowledge about the subject matter, about constitutional law or whatever. I mean, we've got probably four or five people in my immediate area that are well-versed in that and ask them if they would be willing of which, uh, the, to kind of share a class or or give them some guidelines about how to get back to our constitutional republic. And uh, I, I think you'll find in most instances that you're going to get a lot of, of support in that because we all want the same thing. We want to be free. We want to be happy. And we want to be safe in our homes and our property. And so you need to ask around. But you got to do it. Uh, the ultimate goal is to get it done in mass and get the people educated, at least the foundation. You don't have to know everything about law. That's not required. But then, then you can approach your sheriff and ask him that if he would be willing to participate and let him know that you have all of this, that he has all of your backing. Because if you're going, if sees you're going to leave him standing out there on his own, uh, he's not going to do it. He can, and he can't fight that all on his own. He has to have public support, and it's our duty and our privilege to give him that report, as long as he's willing 
to get back on the constitutional side because that's the oath that he gave to we the people that voted for him. So it kind of puts him in a little bit of a box, uh, in a big box as far as that goes, because he's elected as a constitutional sheriff and he took an oath as a constitutional sheriff. So we now have uh, a finger that we can point now, Sheriff, wait a minute. Uh, you, you're not to be doing that, and here's why. They want the same things we do in most instances, but they just don't know. They've not been learned in law, and that's what we're finding with all the sheriffs we're dealing But they're coming around. They are now coming around. Before, it was just a listening ear. Then it said, well, no, I don't think uh, I'm, I'm interested in doing that, and we kept approaching them and saw – that what we were doing was lawful uh, and that they had lots of people. That meeting I attended that I spoke in the other night was loaded with people. I was shocked to death about how many people showed up. And a bunch of those want to come to my law class this coming Sunday evening. I do a a law class uh, at that particular location here in Medford. But I'm just saying to answer your question, Jim, is that that's how you have to start. Somebody has to take the lead. And I don't mean that you have to be the leader, but collectively you seek out somebody who has that God-given gift and education or learning or experience, whatever the case is, and let them know that here's what we want to do. Because I'm telling you, folks, if you don't do that, you're going to lose it. And I think that's very evident to everybody with half an eye open. That's right. You're going to lose it if you don't. And, and, and folks, don't fall victim when people, when you start talking about us, people say, oh, that's just a conspiracy theory. You're a conspiracy. You're, you're a consp- that, 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 that are, those are terms, right? Those are terms that the powers that be, the ones that are in control, those are terms they float out there to make people that are speaking truth look like idiots. Don't fall, don't fall into it. What Ron is saying here today, believe me, I've had him on my show 30 times. I know Ron well, talk to him often. This is not a conspiracy, what we're talking about today. Don't let anybody tell you any different. This is not a conspiracy. This is not, well, this has been tried before and that never, if if you've tried it before and it hasn't worked, it's because your whole system is corrupt. It's not because you didn't follow the law. It's because the people that are supposed to be the, the, uh, the protectors of the law aren't following the law, protecting our rights. The, the, you know, these, this is, this is not a conspiracy is basically what I want to say. Look into this. And get Ron's books. Look into my videos. They're free on my website. Again, I, I encourage you to watch that video series called The Truth Will Set You Free. Ron Gibson, right here on this show today, did a five-hour video, all free, on Northwest Liberty News YouTube channel. Watch it until you know it, in and out and up and down, and then you can take the power back. You have the power. They've just tricked you into thinking that they have it. Ron, is that a fair statement? Well, the- That is absolutely a correct statement, and thank you for bringing that up. Uh, You know, I've got a document here that I wanted a little quote. Uh, It says, apologize to no one. And for the purpose of our goal in life, that we may be led by Almighty God to do good for ourselves and others, that we as Americans need to have a course of which is set by divine guidance. So therefore, we apologize to no one for our undertaking. Wow. Wow. Yeah, heavy stuff, man. All right, Ron, we're, uh, we're, coming, uh, we're coming here to the end of the show here. We just had a couple of minutes left. Let's see if anybody's here on the, uh, calling in on the phone here. Uh, we do have one caller here, so we can get this caller in here before the end of the broadcast. Uh, we only got a couple minutes left. Caller, you're live on the air. Thanks for calling in. I didn't notice you until just now. Go ahead and uh, give out your name and the city or state that you're calling from, please. Your first name's fine. Hi, I'm Lori, and I am calling from Minnesota. Lori from the great state of Minnesota. Hi, Lori. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Wonderful show. Wonderful show. Got good information. Um, The only thing I was wondering is um, uh, the other books he was talking about. How would I go about getting some of those other books that he was talking about? 
Um, mm. Wondering um, a website or some of that other Are stuff. You... We, I think that. You saying the books I, I held up, that, the book um, I held, the book I held up in front of the, the book I held up in front of the, the camera. You mean that book and then his other book? Um, no, no, okay. That, that one I, that one, that one I got, I got that information. But um, the book about the patents and uh, you're not a slave. That one. Um, wondering how would I go about getting those? Um, I definitely believe once all the fraud and everything is taken care of, that we are going to definitely keep our great country. And we are going to uh, fight the system. I definitely believe we're going to shine. Oh, I think so too. Well, I, I, here, if you want to get those books, those are both books that were authored by Ron. So they're forty-five dollars for each book: the title book, the the the, the, the uh, "You're Not a Slave" book, and the colloidal and the uh, patent uh, title one that I held up in front of the camera. And here's Ron's address: Ron Gibson, and, and as he said, check or money order. Ron Gibson, eleven North Peach Street. Medford, Oregon, 97501. Okay. Again, Ron Gibson, 11 I, North Peach Street, Medford, Oregon, 97501. He, he owns both those books, and he'll send them to you. I think I was in the process of calling while you were trying to get that address out. No problem at all. Is that, is that, uh, is that what Sounds you needed? Sounds good, and you guys are giving some really good information out, and you guys are right on the money. Well, thanks right so much. on the money on everything. Well, thanks so much, Carla. We do appreciate you calling in. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Bye now. Okay. You know, like, go ahead, Jim, Brad. if I may, real quickly, sure. uh, they, I have a PayPal account, and my email address is the access to that PayPal account. So if that would be a choice or method of payment, <clears throat> then that's fine. If you use that, be sure and give me your address. So I got a place to send. I got people all the time sending me money and their name and no address. So I need your address and your phone number so that I can get back with you in case I need to talk with you or clarify what it is that you want or ordering. You want the one book or you want both books or several of one book and one of the other, whatever the case is, let me know so I know what to send you and where to send it. So I just put all your email. I just put your uh, your um, mailing address stuff here in the uh, chat room, Ron, so people can reach out to you there. Ron, again, uh, great stuff, man. I mean, I, I you know I I can't tell you how the, just the stuff that you're the information you're dishing out is just gold. It's golden. I mean, there's no other way to put it. One more time, we got about a minute left here before I'm gonna let you go. Give us out one more time your phone number and your email address. Before we go, so people can reach out to you and get this, 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 these golden nuggets of information you're dishing out to us, Ron. Go ahead. Okay, my phone number is five four one six two one five five four eight. That's six five four one six two one five five four eight, and my email address is d. R I T E C R G at hotmail dot com. That's D R I T E C R G at hotmail dot com. Got it, Ron. Uh tell you man, can't tell you how much I appreciate you being on the broadcast with us today. God bless you and your work and we'll have you back here in two weeks and we'll talk about something else that's you know Something, some other, some other, uh, uh, you know, con that they're running on us. We'll expose, an, we'll expose another one coming up in two weeks with Ron Gibson. Ron, thanks so much for being here today, brother. Always appreciate you. All right, thank you, folks. Appreciate it. Ninety thanks. seconds. All right, Ron, we're just running out of time. Thanks, brother. We'll talk soon. Okay, folks, there goes, uh, there goes, Bye-bye. there goes Ron Gibson. Um, yeah, what can I say? Uh, it's it's uh, it's a college education and 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 uh in a, in two hours so rewatch this video as often as you can send it out to your friends uh because if you don't know your rights they're not going to tell you they're not going to tell you your rights believe me believe, crooks don't tell you they're going to come to your house to rob you they just Six rob you seconds. they just show up and rob you anyway that's all i got for today we appreciate you looking in thanks so much for ron gibson for coming on the broadcast if you want to support this program, Montana Gazette, Gazette Radio.com, Montana Gazette Radio.com, or 
MontanaDailyGazette.com. Till next time, James White for Montana Gazette Radio saying bye now. Second. Mm-hmm.